um, as I, as we were praying and and you know we were worshiping and and A Rob was interceding for um, the entertainment mountain. There was clashing in the spirit when he was doing that, and I heard in my spirit, "What about me?" I came here for me. I need something for me. And he's like, come on, pray with me. And so I started, you know, like I always do. And what I need, what I need this house to understand, I'm going to say this house, because every house is called to different things. This house is called to pioneer. This house is called the leader of this region. That's what we are. That's what we are. And so to be that, we cannot be consumed in self. Batman wasn't consumed in self. Notice that the movie, going back to the movie, I know it's all fiction, right? But there's some truth in that. Batman was not consumed in himself or his feelings or how hard the battle was or how I'm one man against this world. You know, it wasn't that way. He went out and did what he got to do. But as A-Rob was praying for the entertainment mountain, it blessed me because it reminded like the mission and vision statement of our church just flashed before my eyes. And we have one of them is the entertainment mountain. And I'm going to tell you because I need to mature Christians because I'm around a lot of Christians and there's not a lot of maturity. And that scares me because there's a lot of Christians going to churches. Bless me, Lord. Oh, bless me. The Bible says, I will bless you, Lord. But we're calling for blessing. And God wants to bless his children. He's a good daddy. But we have to understand that when somebody is, especially in the house, is, is, is calling out names in Hollywood and prophesying over their souls, our mission statement says we will take the entertainment mountain. We've been praying into that. And it's happening right up here. Right up here. And then I hear... And I'm not trying to rebuke, please. I have actually a comfort word for you. So please, I'm not trying to rebuke. And I hear, what about me? Half of me understood because I was there when I didn't know the Lord real well. I had a fire and a passion for God and I wanted to know God. But I remember coming to this house and being like, Ugh, is he talking about the nations again? <laughs> I need to take my own life. Why would I care about what's happening in the nations? Because I was immature. But I stayed in the game and I kept pressing in, even when I didn't understand and when I thought everything in this house was so weird. Uh, I stayed in the game and, and, I, and I allowed myself to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I learned is you cannot take a mountain without intercession. You can't take a mountain without a prophetic word. See, the word goes out first and then the transformation comes because the Bible says that God does nothing unless he reveals it to the prophet first. That's Bible. Amen. Right? And so our mission statement says that we are taking the entertainment mountain. That's why he said, pray with me, people. That's the engine to that ministry. And so we have to be a community of people. This is not church. I'm so tired of the Western-minded church. And I'm not saying church like the, I like the church in the Bible. When it says church there, it means community. It does not mean a cute little building, a pretty little building with all these comforts and all these amenities. It means a group of people who are going to gather together and literally take cities and nations for the glory of God. Those are the people that I want to be yoked to. I want world changers. That's my mindset. That's the mindset of this house. That is what this house is called to do. And I know that we push people to another level. Because it's like, Ugh, but what about me? And the Lord's like, it's not about you. And I'm going to prove it to you in the Bible. It has never been about us. But the beautiful thing about God is he's a very personal God, but he's also a very corporate God. And so our personal blessing comes through corporately walking together. And so I just really wanted to say that. And so that person that was, you know, what about me? I have something for you. 
and the Lord hears you and he knows your pain and he knows your suffering. Um, he knows the fear. He knows the insecurity. He knows that there is times when there's no vision and when we're just kind of walking through life and you just don't know where you are going. The Lord says, don't fear. Don't fear. There's times that you feel fear and it's very real and, and sometimes it's a it's an entrapment how am I going to get out of this fear and you really you you try to read the word and you try to believe but the fear overtakes you I'm going to give you a word today just walk in the word you when you walk in the word even when that emotion or whatever tries to override it you walk in the word and believe me the spirit of God will start counseling those emotions and subduing them for you there is deliverance in this season. That's fact. I, I, I'm not preaching to you my thought. I'm telling you what's happening because I overcame it. Because it's a revelation to me. It's not knowledge. I'm not preaching to you, oh, I read in uh, you know, Psalms 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. No, 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 no. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I'm not preaching to you a cute little sermon that I downloaded from the computer. Amen. I am teaching you the revelation that I've gotten from intercession time with a community of believers that are willing to get up early in the morning and die <laughs> for you, to pray for you, to lift you up, lift up this house to lift up the leaders of this house and so i really want to take this time and just really understand the season that you're in i've heard many times where you know what we're in the season of a righteous revival i've heard that it's very true we are i actually got that word a year and a half ago i was tickled pink when i went to cheryl's and she had a whole cd i was like ah, ah, thank you for making music to go with my revelation and she was talking about this righteous revolution and I texted Linda and I'm like, you can't believe what she said. This is amazing. And so it, it brought such joy to me. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. They think that a righteous revolution, well, that's her song, a righteous revolution, but a righteous movement Oh my gosh, this is a righteous movement. I'm going to do everything right. The spirit of the Lord is going to move on me and things are going to be great. I'm going to teach you something really quick. Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. Now, this is a message that's not preached very much. And this is where people get twisted. I'm doing everything right. I'm getting up in the morning, I'm praying, I'm seeking the Lord, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Why is everything going wrong in my life? Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. What is all? Before that, scripture it talks about taste and see that the Lord is good oh taste and see that the Lord is good blessed is the man who trusts in him oh fear the Lord you his saints there is no want to those who fear him this is before Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. I've heard many people say, taste and see that the Lord is good. But then fail to do verse 1 of that scripture. I will bless the Lord at all times. Do you think that it blesses the Lord to take people in Hollywood out of hell? And isn't it funny that the Lord chose to speak that word during a prophetic moment? I mean, th during a, a worship 
and praise moment? Isn't that deliverance? Yet sometimes God's community misses it because we're so consumed in... Let me tell you what they teach me in cycling class. When you're doing this because you're stressed out and you're like... <laughs> They're like, duh, open your chest, look up, look straight ahead, and breathe. Do not look down, do not look to the side, look straight, open yourself up. What do we like to do when we're in pain? We've got to open ourselves up. Lord, what do you want? And when we bless the Lord with what he wants, because we're about his heart, then that's when we open ourselves up for results. Because if it's not gonna fly in a workout routine, it will not fly in the spirit. It's that simple. Everything manifests first in the spirit before it manifests in the physical. We have to understand that. Before you get results, even going to the gym for eight months, it manifests in your mind first, right? And then after you walk it out and you do it for a long period of time, long. The older you get, long. The older you get, harder. And guess what that means? Good. That means you get to endure longer. Right? But as we get older in the spirit, I've seen many, many, and it breaks my heart. I'm just old now. I have no purpose. No, 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 no. You're supposed to endure longer. You're supposed to go harder. You're supposed to outdo me. Because Moses never gave in until the day he gave his last breath. I'm preaching good, but then you guys are saying amen. <laughs> yeah, you better be. Anyways, I, I, wanna, I just, I just want to recap real quick on the afflictions, which is Psalms 34, 19. I'm going to go back here. Affliction, many are the afflictions of the righteous. What, what does it mean to be afflicted in the original language? This is what it means. It means evil, bad, disagreeable. It means worse than, worst, sad, unhappy, evil, bad, unkind, bad, evil, wicked, in general, of person, of persons, of thoughts, deeds, actions, distress, misery, injury, calamity, evil, distress, adversity, evil, injury, wrong, evil, misery, distress. Now, I, I'm doing this on purpose. Right, because we seem to think that automatically, if these things are happening in our lives, there must be something horrifically wrong with us. But we have to praise the Lord at all times. Like Psalms 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. Now check this out. When does deliverance come when we line up? You see, we lined up with the praise, with the worship. You know, we lined up, right? We're lining up. Shut up, afflictions. Shut up. Shut to the up. We are lining up right now. I will bless the Lord on my soul. And then check out what happens next. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. And... Their faces were not ashamed. Now I'm going to stop right there. It says there that their faces were radiant. If you study scripture, you will notice that righteousness and light are always mixed. Jesus always says there was, you know, there was light because of their righteousness. Now I'm paraphrasing. Do you notice that in that scripture it talks about that? Their faces were radiant. Do you want to know what righteousness means? It means to be steadfast and it means to trust. That's what it means. Even when your emotions and your circumstances are completely counseling you and telling you otherwise. And what society does now is they want Jesus' credentials. I will trust you when you show me your credentials. 
That's not faith. That's worldly. It's a command. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you realize that we don't really even have to pray for blessings? I know that's going to boggle your mind. Because church has taught different. You don't need to pray for a blessing because in this very scripture, blessings are already ours. They belong to us. When we do things the way he's called us to do it, I don't have to pray for blessings because the blessings are just going to overtake me because I am walking with the king of kings. I'm going to be so blessed that I got to give away blessings because it's too much to handle. That's Bible. That's Bible. And in this hour, we need to raise up and train up a true righteous generation that is going to line up with the very word of God. I love, love, love the way Paul prays. Love. If you ever wonder how should I pray, I'm going to reveal to you the most powerful secret ever. Paul never prayed for finances. And what do we do? Oh, Lord, I have 20 bucks in my account. Please give me 40. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm trying to be funny. Um, he didn't. I'm going to read to you what he prayed. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 13 to Verse 13 through 14. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit's promise. Now there it says, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed. So what has to come first? the word, but then we have to what? And then you're what? We want to be sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit without trusting God and without believing his word. Do you want to know what it means to have fear of the Lord? Because righteousness and trust are sisters, with, are, are sisters and they're always together. Fear of the Lord needs to be constantly in our hearts. Constantly. And what that means is that you re we reverence the word of God. We reverence the spirit of the living God. We reverence the Holy Spirit. And we reverence the direction of God. Meaning we reverence it and honor it more than we honor our own circumstances. And when we can walk in that, oh baby, <laughs> there is no such thing as impossible. That's the move that Cheryl was talking about. I'm able to teach it. But that's what she was talking about. She didn't get into the teaching because she was giving it out prophetically. And she's a worshiper. We're all called to do different things. My passion literally is to teach. Why is my passion to teach? Because as a kid, I got moved from first grade to second grade to third grade because I had crappy teachers who did not give a hood what would happen in my education and I became literally illiterate at fourth grade because nobody cared. I refuse. God trusted me with people and souls. I will not raise up an illiterate generation in the spirit. I will not. If I have to have 50 people only, I will love the people and love the crowd. I will not be those preachers that hate the people, love the crowd. I will not. That is not me. That is not who I am. I love people too much. I can't do that to people. I care about people with all my heart, and I never want to lose that. I never want to become so hardened that I don't care about people's lives. That is not what God has called me to do. God has called me to teach because he redeems every broken situation. Now, was life hard because of that? That happened to me? Yes. But you know what's so good is God redeemed that and said, now teach. 
You weren't taught? Let's conquer that. And now you teach because you know what it feels like not to be taught. Every broken place in our lives literally is the most powerful place we could ever walk and stand on. Know that. Don't wallow in your hurts and pains. Don't wallow even in the mistakes. Learn from them and conquer them, and we will be more powerful the next time we do it. And if we fall again, that's okay. We'll get right back up again, and we'll try it again because that's what God has called us to do. The next warning that I got, and I literally, I was fighting God on this, because honestly, I was like, God, I don't want to go there, but I have to go there. For the sake of time, because I know we went long with worship, I'm not going to go too long today, but I wanted to say this. Numbers 20, 11, got this in intercession the other day. Uh, it was talking, and I'm just going to paraphrase the story, okay, because I don't want to get into it, because I still have some other things to say. It was talking about Moses. And I remember I was in prayer, you know, with the Lord. I was feeling the joy of the Lord. I'm like, woo, this is powerful. And then the Lord starts talking to me about when Moses uh, hit the rock. And I'm like, ooh, that's provision. The Lord's going to provide. This is beautiful. And then he reminded me. He's like, no, 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 no. Uh, the one where he struck the rock twice. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not a good one. That's, that's, not, that's not uplifting. See, we're here to intercede, Lord. We're here, you know, to hear your voice. And the Lord's like, no, 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 this, this, is, what I, this is what I'm asking you to speak about. And I'm like, okay. So I just kept praying, you know, just rebuking myself in case it was my flesh. And uh, I couldn't shake it for the life of me. And it was where, where Moses struck the rock twice when the Lord told him to speak to it. And so I'm going to read a little bit here now. Forgive me, I have... Uh, a little bit of a like Jewish Bible. I like this one because it has more of a actual context of the original than than the other versions. Okay, so I'm just going to read a little bit. So so stay with me. Now there was no water for the community, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron, poor A. Rob and Linda. The people quarreled with Moses, saying, "If only we had." If only we had died when our brothers died before Aldonai. Now, why have you brought the community of Aldonai into this wilderness for us and for the livestock to die here? Why have you brought us from Egypt to bring us to this evil place, a place without grain, fig, grapevine, or pomegranate, and there is no water to drink? So Moses and Aaron went from before the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of Aldonai appeared to them. Aldonai spoke to Moses saying, take the staff and gather the assembly. You and your brother Aaron speak to the rock before their eyes and it will give out its water. You will bring out water from the rock and you will give the community something to drink along with their livestock. So Moses took the staff, then before the presence of Adonai, just as he had commanded him. I like this part. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly in front of the rock. He said, listen now, you rebels. God did not say, call them rebels. He said, Speak to the rock because I'm going to give him water. <laughs> and then Moses comes along and says, gather together, you rebels. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. And we know the story. Water gushed out. They, oh, and then the Israelites had enough to drink and even enough for their animals. But who got in trouble? Moses. As I was praying, I was like, Lord, that's just really wrong. I don't even want to talk about that story. I just think it's really unjust and unfair, and I just don't agree, so I'm just not going to say it, because then I'd be a hypocrite if I'm trying to speak your word on something that on my heart is just not settled on. And then I got slapped across the head by the Spirit and said, be quiet, get, get it together. It's not about you. Remember, it's about me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot about that. Um, I, I want to rewind a little bit. 
How long were the Israelites in, wil in the wilderness with Moses? Moses has been leading them for a while now. 37 at this time. It's 37 years. 37. I'm so sorry. I know a lot of you. If you are leading people for 37 years and you are doing everything God is telling you to do and people are still complaining. And what I love about this story is if you study it out, what the Israelites did wrong is they followed a lot of the patterns that their parents did. That should be an eye opener for a lot of us. They didn't really follow the pattern of God, even though they said they were. But the moment that Moses said, we're doing this, they would go against Moses and follow the pattern of their culture. For 37 years. And then they turned around. Let me tell you how this whole story started. They were blaming Moses because of the little spirituality that they had gotten and very little growth. This is all your fault. You brought us out of all of this for this and they refused. Let me tell you, it, they were the problem. They refused to repent for the patterns of their ancestors. That's one. Two, they were rebellious against leadership. So when Moses said, gather together, you rebels, he wasn't lying. He really, he really was being serious. Like that is, that was the truth. That was their label. But that is not what God said for him to say. He let his emotion run away with him. What emotion was that? Anger. I am livid. I've put up with all of you and you cannot see that you're the problem. And it wasn't even coming out of a place of pride. It was a place of truth. It was true. However, let me tell you what God's plan was for this and why Moses got in trouble. And this is where it just touched my heart. And I'm like, God, I, I understand. I get it. I, to I, I see what you're doing. Moses was a model for the nation. He was a model. He wasn't God, but he was the model and the, repre the representation of God. He wasn't God. I want to make sure to, to, to say that. But he represented God in a human form. So when God said, speak to the rock, he was, trying to, he was actually trying to help Moses because they were rebellious. They were hardened because in their hearts, they thought God did not love them. And so what Moses tried to do was he tried to take vengeance into his own hand and strike the rock twice because in that moment he showed anger to the people oh god our god see god is angry their hearts couldn't be the pride and the anger and the rebellionness and the witchcraft couldn't be broken down that way it had to be broken down by speaking a place of relationship a place of intimacy and so god was vindicating moses but moses couldn't see it he thought it was just unfair. And he got caught up in that whirlwind. As leaders, and many of you are being trained up to be leaders. Many of you have a passion to lead. It's a very serious position. Whether you're leading one person, you cannot be trusted with two if you cannot lead one right and the governing starts at home government starts at home and from there governing a church governing the region governing the nations do we see that okay so here is a leader who got in trouble because he showed God's anger when God wasn't angry. He never said that. He didn't honor God at that moment because God never said that. What you did 
may have been correct in your eyes, but that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to speak. And in that, you were going to be vindicated. As leaders, we have to be very careful. It's a twofold. As leaders and as a congregation. Because the congregation was also in disobedience. And this is the season, and I'm so sick and tired of hearing this. That leader is not God. Why should I listen to that person? I do. I hear God. I do what God tells me. And then they do opposite of what the leader says. You're lying. People perish for lack of knowledge. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to other people around you. You're lying. Because the Bible says, submit to your leaders so it'll go well with you. So guess what? In this, you could see this in this scripture. Moses did it wrong. The people were still blessed. Drop the mic. <laughs> yeah. And they got double blessed to top it off because he disobeyed. They got more water. Not only for themselves, but for their animals. So there was a double portion blessing in a place where the leader was in disobedience. So what do we have to lose? Your dignity, your pride, our rebellion. Do leaders have it all together? I'm going to give you just a quick secret. No, they don't. <laughs> Moses didn't have it all together. Paul didn't have it all together. Peter didn't have it all together. None of them had it all together. Actually, I can't name one except for Jesus that had it all together. Sorry, A-Rob. You're almost there. About 99%. That 1% screws you up, but you're almost there. I'm going to close it up with this. There came a time where, um, and I still kind of hear it, it's, it's the name it and claim it faith, you know. Um, the church started with teaching on stewardship, and it did great. It took nations, it took territories. I mean, the church flourished under the teaching of stewardship. Then what came along after that was the name it and, name it and claim it faith movement, which was where they taught poverty and prosperity. That, I'm sorry, and please correct me if I'm wrong, screwed up the church. And I'm going to tell you why. People started taking their eyes off of lives, nations, regions, territories, and started putting their eyes on themselves and stuff. Now you got to see preachers driving around in Mercedes, and believe me, I, have no, I don't have anything against that. As a matter of fact, they should be driving in the best cars if you ask me. Not because I'm a preacher, but I preached this long before I was a pastor. And I remember I had a lovely brother-in-law who would come against me all the time and say, why are you giving that money to those pastors? <laughs> this want, they want your money. They're driving around in nice cars and you're driving around in a hoopty. Why, why would you do that? And I'm like, and why not? You own a company. What makes you better than somebody who's running the kingdom of God? If you say you believe in God, why should they be driving in a hoopty and you in a Mercedes? There's something wrong with you. I don't believe that they should be driving around in hoopties. I think they should have the best of the best, but I believe they should be given to the leaders out of the kindness of people's hearts. Okay? We are called to steward our talents. That's Bible. And if you read it, the one that was able to had five, was able to bring in 10, had two, was able to bring in five or whatever, they ended up being trusted with regions and cities. What are we after? So what do we have to learn? Stewardship. I'm going to kill the name it and claim it. In this church, Nope. If I have to beat my body and my brain into submission that it's not about stuff, it's about souls, it's about cities, it's about nations, then I will do that because that's what God has called me to do. And that's why I was 
brought here is because sometimes when we pray, we really don't understand what we're praying. Lord, I want to be about your heart. Lord, let me love what you love. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And then God starts putting you in a place where you're being bufferted and you're being chiseled out and God, God's getting rid of everything that makes you you and people pull out and run away. And then you're not part of a big move. Each and every one of us are called to change cities, regions, and nations. Everybody here is called to be a leader. So we all have to take account to what happened to Moses, but we also have to take account of what the children of Israel did as well. They didn't own their sin. They kept blaming their bad situation on the pastor, the leader. You know, that person isn't praying enough for me. That church isn't good enough for me, or whatever the case may be. That's not true. We have to truly be honest and say, okay, Lord, where am I the problem? I remember when I came to this church, there was uh, concrete floors and fold-out chairs. And I went, the first Christian church I went to had pillars, and it was beautiful. It had chandeliers, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I belong here. <laughs> I'm all about scenery. If you go to my house, you'll understand. I'm scenery girl. It's got to be beautiful. Things that are not in place bother me. They bother me. So then I was brought to this church with concrete floors and fold-out chairs. I'm like, nope, nope, this is not God. This is not God. This is not God. This is not God. No, no, no. And they're like, no, no, this, this is, it's a good church, you know. It, um, there are amazing leaders. I'm like, they have two people <laughs> with fold-out chairs and concrete floors. And this man is talking about nations. This is not where I belong. I belong in the church with the pillars and the coffee house and, uh, and the, the lady that would preach and just, I would drop because she would touch my heart, literally. Thank God for the Holy Spirit and his supernatural power that kept me here. And I fought it all the way through. And I remember when I started, the children's church was the weakest department in the face of this planet. Nobody wanted to teach it. Teachers would complain before they went into class and it would bother me. I'm like, oh, that's just wrong. And so the Lord spoke to me and said, you don't like it? I'm like, no, then change it. I'm like, but Lord, you know how I feel about children. <laughs> so yeah, I was a children's church leader teacher and I would go up there and I would teach them Hebrew and they would be like, oh, sorry kids, the Lord told me to do this. I'm doing the best I can. Let's talk about Passover. Let's go back into the Jewish traditions. And they're just like, I don't get what you're saying teacher. I'm so confused. And so, but I listened and I obeyed and we started the children's church department. And once I got a strong team, I was like, okay, I'm not great for this. Cause every time I try to go in there, the kids are like, even Jackie, when I tried to train Jackie, she's like, you need to use smaller words. <laughs> <laughs> They're too big. I'm like, you're right. It's too big. So I gave it over to Jackie cause Jackie loves children. She will even bake cookies for them. Now you know that that woman loves children. My kids, mommy, can you bake cookies for me? No, I don't like to bake. Please don't make me. We'll call Becky. We'll call Becky. She's good at it. She'll, she'll bake for you. So I had to start this thing that I didn't want to start. But the Lord said, start it. And then he said, teenagers. And I'm like, uh-uh. There's going to be blows there. It's not good. <laughs> Ask Karina, like Karina can't get away with anything. Like this is not, these are not my kids, Lord. I'm going to get sued. <laughs> but the Lord knew that that would happen. So then thank God for these awesome people right here, David and Shiloh. Amazing. They took on that task. Bless your heart. And then the Lord's like, okay, go, go, go get some laborers to help these poor two out. Cause oh my God. Gosh, and so then that's what happened so the lord used me in that department but in a very different way he knew that i could not i remember there was one time i tried to talk to them and it just all blew up and david had to come and be like well what exactly did you say again they told me that you said this i said i did say that and they better get it together <laughs> he's like mm, you know don't touch the kids anymore okay so we've got to steward things well now that department's doing good the youth department's doing good. The nursery's doing amazing. And honestly, it's the best I've ever seen. Not because I'm so great. 
but because he's so great. And I'm trying to say this to you all is we all want victory, but nobody's willing to go into the battle for it. We all want freedom and forget that you have to fight in order to have freedom. Don't forget that. You can't ever have freedom without fighting. There's no such thing as neutral ground. Do we understand that? We're just going to keep it neutral. Good luck with that. You know what neutral makes? When you mix red and green, you make brown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Poopy. Poopy. There's, <laughs> I use my hairdresser skills there. You're welcome. Um, honestly, no such thing as neutral ground. If you're not doing anything and you're not fighting for something that's righteous and godly and pure and holy, you're not living. You're not living. And it's bigger than money. Now I'm going to close it up with this prayer, I promise, and I'm done. I am Enos' child, so you know that, that that man can go and go. It's like the Energizer bunny. You go and go. Go and go and go and go. Okay, so <laughs> Ephesians 1.15. Now remember, we talked about Paul, right? I talked a little bit about Paul. I said how you have to trust the Lord, believe in your salvation. Then you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and all his promises. So there's a couple of steps we have to do before we are sealed. Therefore, the, check this out. Ephesians 1. Verse 15 through 23, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, now check this out, he didn't say may give you a building, may give you money, may give you nice car, may give you a big huge bank account, so you you can go lend money to Asia, although he may do that if you're going to advance the kingdom because the kingdom is a franchise. Let's understand that. You have to be an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur in order to be a true kingdom-minded person. Not a church person, not a western-minded church person. I'm annihilating that. But a true church is an entrepreneur. It is a franchise mentality. To go into every mountain and take it. Does that make sense? Okay, he didn't, he didn't pray for any of those things. May give you a spirit of wisdom. This is what he prayed. May give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities, Far above what? All, 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 all. So when we're sitting there saying, oh, I bind up the spirit of witchcraft. No, 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 no. Lord, you are good. You are good God. You taste and see that the Lord is good. When you know that, you are seated high above all principalities because now your heart is enlightened. You've got revelation. You've got knowledge. You have understanding and you are enlightened because now you understand. Now I am lining up where the Father is high above all principalities and power and might and dominion and in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is a prayer. That is how he spoke. And actually, I'm not going to read the scripture. In Matthew, Jesus rebukes people for praying for clothing and praying. It's actually Matthew 6, 25 through 34. I'm not going to read it, but please go home and read that scripture because it talks about, oh, why do you worry about your life? 
goes on to say, why do you worry about your life? Why do you worry about what you're going to wear? Why do you worry about what you're going to eat? Like, why do you worry about those things? And then he goes on to say, I'm paraphrasing, but if you read below it, it says, only the, the, that's what the Gentiles pray. So I looked up what the Gentiles meant, and it ba basically meant like a community, a multitude of people, this, this huge amount of people that pray those prayers. And basically it also said in captions, people that don't worship God. People that don't praise God. Those are the people that pray for those foolish, silly little things. But people that are of the spirit will pray what Paul prayed. Give me wisdom because we don't need stuff. We need wisdom in a bad situation. We don't need a nice car when somebody has a disease. We need to be enlightened. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to work through that situation. We don't need stuff. And I'm not saying stuff is bad. I believe God blesses people with stuff when he knows the stuff will not take you out. So if we haven't got the stuff, then we need to be real honest and say, okay, Lord, I realize that the stuff will take me out and thank you for protecting me because in the end, it's better to live for eternity than to live 80 years here and eternity in hell because the stuff took me out. God is good. I am a miracle. I am a walking miracle. Unless you know my life, you will not understand what I am saying. The fact that I raised up a generation that looks nothing the way I looked right there, even a counselor will tell you that is not even possible. But it's possible because of Christ. And when I say Christ, Christ, that anointing that he carries that breaks all bondages and breaks all yokes and transforms generation to generation. And honestly, people, this is the time where you pray for your family, for your loved ones that you're believing for. I really heard a strong word of the Lord. Intercede for those ones that are lost right now. Intercede for the backslider. I am pouring out my anointing like never before to restore and transform families, to bring them back to restoration. And we need to make room, people. Moses didn't make room. He was hardened. That's another thing we do wrong. Make room for repentance. And don't be so suspicious. They're not your people. They're God's people. And if we're really godly, we'll understand that every human being has a call. Period. End of discussion. If your emotions don't line up, tell them to shut up and praise the Lord. They eventually will. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord. Father, I bless everybody in this congregation right now, Lord. I speak blessing. I speak restoration. Father God, I bind up all fear in their life. I bind up all worry. I bind up, Father God, that heart that's fretting. Father God, I break that spirit. I break that yoke right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I speak freedom in these people. I speak a release of freedom in every area of their lives. Father, that when they walk out of this place today, they will be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.